morning, church. Um, our scripture reading is from Mark chapter 2, verse 1 to 12. And it reads, The Son of Man forgives and heals. When he entered Capernaum again after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together that there was no more room, not even in the doorway. And he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves and said to them, why are you thinking these things in your heart? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat, and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. This is the word of the Lord. We are in week three of the Gospel of Mark, our current series. Uh, it is easy to catch up if you missed out on week one or two. I really do encourage you, if you missed out, please catch up. It's one book, it's one story, and it's epic and we try to weave it together as we preach through it. The book is about the life of Jesus, and the reason why we're studying it is because we celebrated his birth at Christmas, and we'll be celebrating his death and resurrection at Easter. So his life comes in the middle. As you read the Gospel of Mark, as you study it deeper, as you read it fast sometimes and slow other times, lots of verses or just a small amount of verses, it is actually supposed to be a really thrilling experience. It's a book that moves quick. We see as soon as, as soon as, immediately, immediately, then, as soon as, then again. That's how the book is written. It's also supposed to challenge you in your life of faith. It's supposed to present a refreshing picture of Jesus to you. I've read through Mark now since we started preaching the series three times. Sometimes I go fast, sometimes I go slow. But it is a phenomenal, phenomenal book. How's it been for you guys? Is anyone tracking with Mark and enjoying it? Is he leaving his mark? <laughs> anyone? I'm a dad. I can make dad jokes. I'm also a pastor, which means I can make pastor jokes. Now, a combination of dad and pastor jokes, fam, that's something to behold. But I won't bless you with that this morning. When I say the words forgiveness and healing, what does that do to you? Let's just sit in that moment. Forgiveness. Healing. What happens inside of you? Both heart, mind, body, and everything in between. I think it's a good question. Here's what C.S. Lewis says, great quote from the man. Everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. So I want you to just hold and acknowledge the feelings and the emotions and the thoughts you just had. Because today's sermon will be about forgiveness and healing. Now before we jump in, I want to draw your attention to the different characters in the story. Lebo read it well. And in the story, you would have seen that there are multiple characters in this story. Maybe think about it this way. Think about a series, right, that has seasons and episodes. What I'm about to do today is like showing you one episode that is part of a series that has way more seasons and episodes. And then before we watch the episode, I explain a whole lot of things to you so that the episode can make sense. And then we'll watch the episode. But we won't run through it. Like we'll pause, we might rewind, we'll pause again because I want to make sure that you can really, really understand this episode. Are you guys with me? So that's what we're going to do today. Okay, so let's look at the characters first. In verse 1, he, who's he? 
He is Jesus, the one that's currently winning in the book of Mark. The book started by saying he's the Christ, he's the Messiah, and then the book started backing up that claim with irrefutable proof that that is who he is. His title was confirmed by God himself. He started speaking and teaching, and after he spoke and taught, he showed everyone what he meant when he said the kingdom of God is near. And we see as the story progresses that this message of the kingdom of God is for all people, which is great, great news. And the news of this man, Jesus, has started to spread. And he's become quite the news in that area. Verse 2, we see many people. Now these will be people from Capernaum, the, vi the uh, village where Jesus stayed, and also surrounding villages. Remember fam, people didn't have cars back in the day. They did have horse and carts. But you didn't have a horse and cart if you were a lowly, small agricultural farmer. So people used their feet to walk to wherever they had to be. So if it says the surrounding villages or this area or that area around the Sea of Galilee, it's all like within 10 kilometers from one another. Mostly, it's two and a half to four kilometers from each other. And you can walk four kilometers if you walk really slowly with your uh, Jerusalem Havaianas in about an hour, right? If you take a break here and there, and uh, you keep walking at 15 kilometers an hour. So many people, not only from Capernaum, but also from the surrounded village. Okay? And then in verse 3, we see four friends. They are called they in verse 3. Four compassionate people. Four committed people. Four people torn between this reality of we have this paralyzed friend who we need to take care of and who we want to take care of, but he can't do anything for himself. Every time we touch him, we become unpure or unclean, which means that we can't go and worship. We really can't ever leave him alone. So he's the person that all of us have to take care of the whole time, even though we have a whole lot of other things to do. But we are committed to him and we have compassion on him because he's our friend. Do you guys see the four friends? Just think about this. If they touch him, they can't go worship. So they have to take turns to touch him, and they have to take turns to go worship. That's a massive sacrifice. Can you imagine it? Guys, enjoy church this morning. I can't come <laughs> because I touched him yesterday. And he can't do anything for himself. Four friends. And then we see the paralytic, a paralyzed man. Verse 3. Now, don't think of a paralytic or a paralyzed person in the way that you would think about a paralyzed person today. Why? Because they did not have any of the medical privileges, equipment, or treatment we had. No adult nappies, no linen savers, no tube feeding, no wheelchairs, no hospital beds, no stoma bags, no drains, no physios, nothing. A paralyzed person lying on a mat in his own bodily fluids and in anything else that would either enter or exit his body. That's who we have. We might be filled with compassion if we see this person. In the first century, compassion wasn't the main reaction. It was rather, let me stay clear of this person because it's clear to me that that person has a lot of trouble and I don't want that person's trouble in my life. That person is an outcast. That person cannot contribute to life or economy or anything. So I'm going to go around this way. That's how it was. That's why the four friends in the story is such a beautiful picture of compassion and commitment because they could also just go, yeah, dude, a uh, bless, I'm off this way. That's the paralytic. Lonely. And wrestling with why am I paralyzed? Why is this my portion? Why did I have to be the one? Because in the first century world, it was common to think that in cause and effect. If this, then that. If not this, then not that. 
And if you read the book of Proverbs or wisdom literature in the Old Testament, you'll see that it says that if you do obey God, things will go well with you. If you don't obey God, things will not go well with you. Therefore, obey God. That's why we have a book like Job in the Old Testament that says, whoa, 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 hang on a second. It doesn't always work like that. Because Job was a righteous man and he obeyed God and he lost everything. So what's up with suffering in this world? But it was common for people in the first century to think, if you were sick, it's because you did something. Now this person is lying there going, what did I do to deserve this? Why am I the stinky one? Why am I the dirty one? Why am I the outcast? Why do I only have four friends that really care for me? Why couldn't I walk? Why me? That's the paralytic. And then we see in verse 6, some of the scribes, that's how they are described. Scribes were experts in the Old Testament. Experts in the law of Moses. Experts in the prophets and the writings and the whole story of God and His people. They were people who said, check this, we are going to study this thing so thoroughly that the day the Messiah comes, we will know exactly who He is. That was their claim. They even said we will live a holier life than most other people. We will live secluded from a mainstream life and we will study the Scriptures and we will obey the Lord to such an extent that we will not miss the coming of the Messiah. We won't. We'll know. We'll know. And that's why when they heard that he came, they went to go see. Because they wanted to be sure. Are you guys with me? Now, think of these characters. So Jesus, the many people, the four, the paralytic, and the scribes. Five characters. Think of them in this context. Let me show you some pictures. I brought you some, which I think will be really, really helpful. So this is a welcome sign to Capernaum, modern day. If I can have uh, the pics up, please, Rudolf. There you go. It's pronounced Kfarnachum, the town of Jesus. Welcome to Capernaum. Here we go. This is what it looks like. Nice. What do you guys think? It's an archaeological site. It was dug up. Can you see how small the village is? Do you guys remember I told you that the church grounds is bigger than Capernaum? So two football fields. There you go. 150 to 350 people lived there in the time of Jesus. And if you follow my finger, do you guys see some walls here? That's a room in a house. The houses were built to this height. So even I would be too tall for most of their houses. Why were the houses built to this height? Because your lounge was on your roof. Why was your lounge on your roof? So that in the evening, when the wind blew over you, you wouldn't die of heat. Natural aircon. That's how they rolled. So see a really small village, a really small village of really small houses, really close to one another. That's where all of this plays off. Okay, Rudolf, if I can have the next one. This was the synagogue. There you go. Nice big building. Lots of wealth. Funded by the rich folk in Jerusalem. We don't want to worship in the slums now, do we? So let's make sure that we have a really nice building. Do you guys remember a few weeks ago I told you when they left the synagogue and they went to Simon's house, it's like walking from here to the doors of uh, Dwerinkler Family Church. Do you guys remember that? Okay, cool. So next slide, please. Also in Capernaum, you have this absolutely colossal religious heritage site or a chapel built over something significant. Do you guys know what it is? Let me show you the next one. So this is to protect that no one ever does anything against those foundations. Can you guys see it? It almost looks like a hexagon or a pentagon. That is Simon's house. The very house where all of this that we just read plays off. Cool, huh? So the chapel was built to protect it. And you can go up into the chapel and then you can view the floor of the house. Okay, so look at the house here. There you go. That's where it all went down. There are two sets of foundations to this house. The one was the foundations it had when this miracle happened. 
And then actually Peter's house became a church in Capernaum. So they uh, uh, actually renovated it and made it bigger. So of all the houses in Capernaum, if you look at them, Peter's house would be the biggest one because it became a church. Cool, huh? Just think about that. Uh, Y'all, yeah, fam, seeing that I'm one of the apostles now, we might just have to convert my house into a church. It's really small. It's very, very small. So don't think about this whole story in the context of a church building and someone would come through the roof here and you'd have to shout at them, Hey, what are you guys doing? What are you doing on the roof? It's not like that. It's dusty, it's dirty, it's absolutely chaotic, and it is very, very small. Simon's house wouldn't even be as big as three of our rows or four of our rows of chairs in these two blocks. That's it. And the people who are standing in the doorway are standing here, and Jesus is sitting there where my Emu is, and the people who are breaking down the roof is right here. Like I can tug on their trousers going, Yay, what are you doing? And it's mud and grass and sticks and shouting and chaos. That's the context of the story. Now, I'm a Bible nerd. Does that help you? Okay, it helps me a lot. Love it. I also want to draw your attention quickly to our discipleship journey. We say at Fellowship City that a disciple loves God and loves people. That's, that's what a disciple is. And just to make sure that we know how that happens, we say, top corner, a disciple knows God, a disciple commits faithfully, and a disciple gives generously. That's what a disciple does. And that is how a disciple loves God and loves people. And then just to make sure that we also double-click on those three hours, we say a disciple knows God through His Word, through encountering Him, and through worship. We say a disciple commits faithfully to transformation, that's the change that happens inside of you as you're being made a disciple, to God's people, to His church, and to the mission of the church where God has sent us. And we also say that uh, a disciple gives generously of time, talents, and treasures. Now, this sermon today will take you to knows God and will take you to commits faithfully. So the sermon will take you to those corners of our journey. So you'll read a story today of someone encountering Jesus. You'll read a story of the transformation that happens when you do encounter Jesus. And then that will draw you into an encounter with Him, knowing Him through encountering Him, and then also committing faithfully to what He wants to do in your life. If you want to know any more about this, uh, we will tell you at our vision casting event on the 25th of Feb, just after the church service. Okay, Whew. lots of context. We haven't, pressed play yet. Ach, we haven't pressed play yet, but are you guys with me? I had to at least draw your attention to all of those things. Now, four things. What do we learn about Jesus through this event? Four things, I'll run through them quickly. First, there are many ways to get to Jesus. Stop panicking. I didn't say there are many ways to be saved. I said there are many ways to get to Jesus. Yeah, I see that. Okay. Secondly, Jesus can't wait to forgive sins. Thirdly, Jesus can perceive, that means understand, know, tell, discern, and grasp what you're thinking. And the fourth one is, Jesus can't wait to heal. And this healing is even more than only physical healing. It's a healing that talks of restoration, of regeneration, being made completely new, of being resurrected, going from death to life. I'll explain that to you when we get there. Shall we pray and then jump in? Let's go. Lord Jesus, we see you, and we are amazed by you, exactly like the people in the story. I want to ask you now, as we go through these th four things that we learn of you, that you will transform us, that we will have an encounter with you, and that we will end in exactly the same way as the people in this story, and that is amazed and giving you thanks and giving you glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to this earth and going to that really small village and doing these awesome things and then preserving them for us to see and to learn and to hear again today. May your name be glorified. We pray that in your name. Amen. Okay, I said there are many ways to get to Jesus. Think about it. There were people who saw and heard themselves. People who were close enough, who saw what Jesus did, who heard what he said. That's a way. There are people who went early for the nice seats. I think that's also a reason why the scribes were so ticked off, because they went early. They were dressed well, 
They had seats in the house. They were the closest to Jesus. Everyone else came a little bit later. But that's a way of getting to Jesus, is being very intentional in your going to see what he's all about. Some people were within earshot, so they couldn't see him, but they could at least hear him. Some people were so far away that they heard secondhand from those who can see and hear. Because I already showed you how small the house is. So it's impossible if you are in a group of 20 or 25 people to be able to know what's going on inside. But then someone in the doorway relays what's going on inside and I still hear it. It is secondhand, but it's still a way to get to Jesus. You guys know what I mean? I almost quoted a scene from the movie Storks because I'm a dad of two toddlers, but I'm not going to. Then you have people who just happen to pass by. I mean, can you imagine this morning, you're just visiting your in-laws in Capernaum. Come kids, let's go. Time for a family visit. And as you rock into Capernaum, you go, whoa, what on earth is going on here? Chaos. Roofs being torn down. People shouting. Paralytics being healed. You know what I mean? So you just stumbled upon it. That's how some people get to Jesus. What I want you to see by saying that there are many ways to get to Jesus is that Jesus is accessible. Jesus wants to be seen. Jesus wants to be found. Jesus wants to be encountered, fam. To such an extent that someone came to Jesus in this story on a mat, through a roof, carried by others. Sometimes that is how someone gets to Jesus. Look at verse 5. It says, seeing their faith. So who decided that this man is going to Jesus today? Have you ever thought about that? Did he say, gents, listen, I heard that Jesus is in the house. Please pick me up and take me. We don't know. Was it his friends who said, listen, guys, listen, if there's one person that can save and heal this man, it's Jesus. We have to go. Did they decide together? Did the four guys say, hey, listen, buddy, we have someone that can heal you. Are you keen? And then he said, yeah, sure, take me. Was there an argument? Please don't embarrass me. Please don't take me on my mat to everyone. Did they doubt when they actually got to uh, Capernaum and they saw all of these people? Did one of the four say, guys, 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 listen, we are going to wait here for ages. Let's leave it. Did all four say, there's no way that we're leaving this place with a paralyzed man today. We will stay here. Like, how, how, who gave the motivation? We don't know. And I think it's intentional. It's so that we can feel the urgency of both the man on the mat and those carrying the mat. Question. If you are on the mat, who will tear down the roof for you in faith to get you to Jesus? Do you have people like that in your life? Do you have people in your life that when you are on the mat down and out, that will tear down a roof to get you to Jesus. Second question, what will you do for someone on the mat to get them to Jesus? Do you guys see that it took faith, boldness, perseverance, dirt, cost, shouting to get the man there? Do you guys think that when they hoisted him up onto the roof, and three, three, boom, and when they started breaking down the roof, do you guys think everyone went, hey guys, listen, just give these gentlemen some space. They would love to get to Jesus first. They're carrying a really stinky paralyzed man who's part of the fringes of society. Let's give him the first chance today. Do you guys think that's what they did? Absolutely not, because everyone wanted to get to him. Get off the roof. No, I'm not going to get off the roof. Leave my foot. Leave my foot. Keep digging. Boom, 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 boom. And Peter goes, hey, you're breaking my roof. Stop it. <laughs> What do you think you're doing? We won't be covered by rain tonight. I paid for that. And Jesus going, pff, 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 pff. just hang on a second. I'm going to quote Deuteronomy now. Let me just get the dust out of my eyes. So in Deuteronomy 6, do you know what I mean? What would you do for someone to get them to Jesus? Here's the truth of this story. This man simply could not have an encounter with Jesus if it wasn't for his friends. Do you guys see this? Can you imagine if they bailed out and said, oh, unlucky. No, 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 no. Their faith said, today is the day. 
Today, this man will get to Jesus. It doesn't matter what the cost. Are we like that? When it comes to people who we know are far from Jesus. People who are destined for eternity in hell. People who you have a relationship with. People who are resistant against the gospel. People who are stuck in sin and addiction and slavery to death. Or do we go, ah, you know what? We live in a world where everyone can kind of make their own decisions. So I've sent him or her a WhatsApp. I think that's good. They can read it again. Is that how we roll? Because this story should shake us up. And this story should make the point that today is the day of salvation. I want to ask you two more questions. Are you on the mat at the moment? Are you? Stuck? Feeling useless? Feeling lonely? Feeling shameful? Feeling stinky? Feeling uncared for? Because if that's you, I want you to know that Jesus is in the game of saving. And he's in the game of making new. And he's in the game of resurrecting. We'll get there now. Who are you taking to have an encounter with Jesus? And fam, I don't think at the moment it's good enough to say the people at work. Names. Go towards names. Everyone has one. Who are you currently taking to have an encounter with Jesus? The name of that person. Why am I asking this? Because Jesus wants to meet them. He wants to take them. May God stir up in us a passion for this in our hearts. Okay, so we learn there are many ways to get to Jesus. Secondly, we learn that Jesus can't wait to forgive. Look at verse 5. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. I go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Did he ask for his sins to be forgiven? And based on whose faith? On their faith, not on his faith. And he gets a new identity. Because now he gets called son. The answer is yes. To all of those. Fam, think about a sponge. Have you ever taken a sponge, put it in water, gave it a squeeze, and then let it soak up the water? And then you take out the sponge and you put it down on a surface. What happens if you touch the sponge? It doesn't matter how lightly you touch it. Water will immediately come out. Why? Because the sponge is drenched with water. Do you agree with me? That's one of the amazing things about Jesus. Touch him and grace flows out. Do you guys see that? He couldn't wait to forgive sins. That is how much he wants to do it. And before anyone asked him to do anything to the paralytic man, that is what he does first. Which is an important thing for us in the story. First things first. Jesus says, what you need above all else is forgiveness. What you need above all else is the restoration of your relationship with the Father who created you in His image. What you need before anything else is a new identity that cannot change and therefore I am calling you Son. Do you guys see it? It's amazing. That's the gospel. That's what this whole story of Jesus becoming a human and then living this perfect life, death and resurrection and then ascending to, uh, to heaven and coming back. That's what this whole story is about. It's about forgiveness of sins, the restoration of relationships between every human being and God the Father who created them, and by giving everyone a new identity, calling them sons and inviting them into His family. Do you know that? Have you heard that message? And have you accepted that that counts for you as well? All the ugly of the mat, gone, no more not bound to the mat or the ugliness of the mat anymore. Because eventually at the end of the story, he gets up and he walks with his mat. We'll talk about that now. Okay, so hang on, hang on, hang on. Why forgiveness without repentance? Did, did he say sorry? Did he say sorry for anything? No, he didn't. So that's odd, because the pattern followed in the Old Testament is bring a sacrifice... 
Say sorry, and then you are forgiven. No sacrifice, no sorry, just forgiveness. So how does that work? That's the third point. Jesus can perceive or understand, know, tell, discern, or grasp what we are thinking. Look at verse 8. It's highlighted there. It says right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit what they were thinking. Sorry, that they were thinking like this within themselves. Why did Jesus forgive the paralyzed man? Because he knew that that is what the paralyzed man needed. He didn't even have to ask. Come on, come on now, fam. Look at his intentionality, his tenderness, his attention to this person. Not a single word. Not a single request. Not a single word of repentance. Jesus lays, eye, lays, his, lays his eyes on him and goes, I know exactly what you need. And then gives him the most important thing first. And that is forgiveness. Do you know that counts for you too? Do you know that when you are on the mat, the knowledge of Jesus, the fact that he's all-knowing, means that he knows exactly what you need. He knew exactly what the scribes thought. So he knows exactly what we think and what we need. Jesus can actually perceive what we are thinking. Think about the scribes. They were supposed to be the first to recognize Him, but somehow they just can't or they won't. And Jesus even knows that. Why can't they? Well, because their firm belief is something as simple as things just can't work this way. Like if we would have written the script, we would have done it a little bit better. The way that the story has panned out from the birth of this king now into the ministry of this king and the coming of this kingdom. Look, if we just, I mean, if you asked us, we would have written a better story. We would have scripted it differently. We would have used different platforms. We would have used different ways. We know better. Jesus goes, I know that's what you're thinking. And then you guys see that Jesus doesn't scold them and he doesn't punish them. He actually knows what they are thinking and then he answers them and he answers them in a way that gives them confirmation of his authority so that they would not doubt him anymore. Fam, that's great news. So the guy on the mat, Jesus knows everything about him. The most resistant party to this whole thing Jesus knows what they are thinking. And Jesus answers both with a confirmation, uh, 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 an answer of confirmation. What He says to the man on the mat is what He needed to hear. And what He says to them is what they needed to hear. And then we see them reacting differently. Okay, look at verse 10. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That is why I am going to do what I am about to do. I'm not shaming you. I'm not scolding you. I'm not chasing you out of the house. I'm not telling you you've had your chance. I'm telling you, resistant scribe, who just can't figure out in your head or in your heart that all of this is true, the one that is arrogant, that thinks he knows better than God, I am answering you as well, so that you may know. Fascinating, isn't it? Are you guys with me? Okay. So many ways to get to Jesus. Jesus can't wait to forgive sins. He can perceive, understand, know, tell and discern what we are thinking. And then the last one, Jesus can't wait to heal. Look at verses 9 to 12 and all the highlights. So Jesus answers the scribes with a riddle. And the riddle is, which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven? Or, to get up, take your mat and walk. It's a trick question, because the answer is yes. Because both are true. Many times in the Gospels, Jesus answers people like that. He gives them a choice, which is an impossible choice to make. Because if they answer this way, it'll, uh, um, um, it'll show everyone what their beliefs are. If they answer this way, 
it'll show everyone that their beliefs are different. And if they say, yes, both are true, then it confirms Jesus' authority with what he said to them. Do you know what I mean? So he answers them with this riddle. So we see that in verse 9. Then we see the confirmation of why he's going to do what he's going to do in verse 10. And then we see the command and the result in verse 11 and 12. What is the command? Verse 11, get up. And what is the result? Verse 12, got up. And then what follows? Everyone astounded. Everyone giving glory to God. And people saying something like, we have never seen anything like this. Why? The answer lies in that word in verse 11, get up. And in the word verse 12, got up. This doesn't mean getting up from a horizontal lying position and standing up straight. Do you know what this means? This means being resurrected, being raised up, getting a new nature, being injected with completely new life. Can I give you proof? Look at it with me. Mark 16 verse 6. This is after the resurrection of Jesus. The women run to the grave. Someone from the grave talks to them and says, don't be alarmed. He told them, you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. There's the word. He's not here. See the place where they put him. That word, he has risen, that Greek word, is exactly the same word that Jesus uses when he says, rise. And then it says, immediately he rose. Do you guys see it? So Jesus did something way more than heal a paralyzed man. First he forgave them, uh, uh, him, and then he gave him brand new life. And this man still hasn't said anything. Crazy. That's the generosity of Jesus. That's the awesomeness of the kingdom. And what happens in verse 12 is so new and so different, and so beautiful, and so compelling, that people are simply astounded, and then they give glory to God, and then they say, we have never seen this. Brand new life, new possibilities. We see that if we carry someone on a mat to Jesus, Jesus will save them, and He will heal them. We've never seen this before. And it's not like, hey, let your paralysis be healed. New identity, forgiveness of sins, restoration of a relationship with God, restoration back into the community, all for free. The guy didn't even ask anything. We have to tell people about this. That's why it says, we have never seen anything like this. And that's why the news keeps on spreading. Fam, this is what happens to us when we are made new. Jesus can't wait to heal. He does first things first, and that is reconcile us to the Father, and then He heals us, He puts us back together, and He gives us new life, resurrection life, regenerated life, a whole new life. That's why we pray for the healing of people. That is why we say if you are sick and you are on the mat and your physical body is stealing life from you, let's ask the healer to bring that life back into you. That's why we do it. Because he does it both. Forgiveness and healing. That's what we learn about Jesus through this event. Twelve phenomenal verses now, isn't it? There are many ways to get to Jesus. Maybe today your response would either be choosing one of those ways or deciding that you are going to take someone to Jesus through one of those ways. Maybe that's your, maybe that's your main takeaway from today. Maybe that's your response, your next step. Go for it. We learned that Jesus can't wait to forgive sins. Fam, maybe today is the day that you need to hear again that Jesus wants to forgive you and He can't wait to do it. He'll never hold out on you when it comes to forgiveness. It's like a sponge drenched in water. If you touch Him, that's what you'll find. It doesn't matter what you did. It doesn't matter for the how many a time, I know that's not the right English, but for the how many a time you've done it. Forgive, forgive, forgive. 
Maybe you feel misunderstood. Maybe you feel lonely. Maybe you need Jesus to perceive, maybe you need to be reminded that Jesus can perceive what it is that you're thinking. There's nothing that you can hide from your Savior. There's nothing that we can hide from Jesus. And there's nothing that we should hide from Jesus. He gets us, fam. He understands where we are. Paul even writes that even when we don't know what to say, the Spirit talks on our behalf. Don't ever make the mistake to think that you need a well-drafted email with the right salutation and the right ending to be able to speak to Jesus. He can perceive what you are thinking. And even if you are sitting here today with serious doubt, like the gospel just doesn't make sense in your head, it hasn't taken root in your heart, you feel resistant to this idea of submitting your life to Jesus because Jesus has dropped you before or He's held out on you or He has forgotten you or He didn't commit to, uh, to the promises He made or He didn't do what you wanted Him to do. So therefore, He can't be as awesome as the Bible says. You're exactly like the scribes. Looking at how things are playing out and just saying that this just isn't according to my will. Well, for you, there'll be a confirmation and an acknowledgement of Jesus' authority. Because that's what it says in verse 10. And then fam, maybe lastly today, you are at a please restore me. Please regenerate me. Please resurrect me. Please heal my body. I want to pray for all of these responses before we respond in worship. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we... We praise your name that you are open and that you are accessible and that you want to be in a relationship with all people. We praise your name for a story like today that just helps us to imagine all the different ways in which we can encounter you. Lord Jesus, if it's, if it's our decision today to find you, please give us the grace and mercy to find you. If it is our mission today to take someone on the mat and to bring them to you, it doesn't matter what the cost is. Please, I pray, give us the courage, give us the perseverance, give us the faith, give us the boldness to bring those people to you. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, that if we struggle with forgiveness, because we struggle to forgive, if we struggle with forgiveness because we are bind or bound by persistent sin in our lives, May your forgiveness flow like living water today. May we experience it anew. May we remember the lyrics, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Thank you for saving people like us. Thank you for saving the man on the mat. Thank you that we know that no one is ever out of reach and that your forgiveness truly is for everyone. I want to pray, Lord Jesus, if we are currently battling in our minds and battling in our hearts and we feel this resistance and this confusion and this uncertainty, either with why we are in the position we are in or with the fact that we feel like you're not acting according to what we would want, Lord Jesus, please meet us like you did the man on the mat and the scribes. Communicate your certainty to us again today in this time. And I want to pray, Lord Jesus, for all of us who are sick, all of us who are in desperate need of healing, all of us who feel like our physical bodies are stealing the life that you gave us to live. I want to pray for your supernatural healing for all of those ailments. How glorious it must have been when the paralyzed man stood again, when he could bend over and roll up his mat, when he could walk with his mat under his arm and go, no longer does this stinky thing define me anymore, but I've been made new by you. We believe that you can do this, Lord Jesus. I want to pray if any of us are on the mat with physical ailments, that you would heal us in your name. We know that you have the authority to do it, and that's the authority that we stand on. All of this I pray in your name, Lord Jesus our living hope. Amen.